Hi, Hans. Hello. I think some issues here. I don't see us live on LinkedIn. Um, but we, you do see us be live on Facebook right now, just not LinkedIn or neither. Yeah, Facebook is live. Hello, Facebook. This is live troubleshooting. That's what people tune in for. Yeah. We are live on Facebook. People are saying that. Thank you for confirming that. So Mark Zuckerberg is watching this. That's good. Okay. Yeah. Thanks for uh, talking us through this. Uh, <laughs> I, I'm sure, yeah. I'm sharing the the Facebook link now. It's a beautiful sunset. People can see that. <laughs> yeah, it was a uh, was a tropical day in Amsterdam. We had kind of an Indian, uh, Dutch Indian summer. Three people watching now. Sorry for the delay, guys. Uh, LinkedIn Live doesn't seem to work. Um, so I will prove you guys when you apply to uh, join the Facebook group. Uh, I have to... I'm the filler guy today. That's that's great. Yeah, so got got someone on Facebook. Like, who's doing the keynote then? <laughs> I'm the opening act. Maybe this is what Jason usually does for us. And whenever there's trouble, uh, that's when you bring on Jason. But I guess he's not here tonight. I don't have any jokes prepared either for this beautiful thing. Um, <laughs> I, I can tell people about this beautiful mega set that we used to have at Robocopy. We would give these to clients. It's right here. Oh, England is playing football. I guess I guess that's an easy pick then. Who would watch that? Now, if you get the opportunity to tune in for two nerds speaking about chatbots, then or watch the football. I think the it's an easy decision. I hope not. Um, yeah, we can also not start because then people miss everything. Oh, I'm almost there. We're almost there. That's great news. So who has actually done some conversation design today? Or are we all just talking about it? Yeah, it's also nice if the people who are uh, already uh, watching us can tell us uh, where they're from. And, and if you were a newbie, So people that prefer chatbots over football, what about creating a chatbot that talks about football? I'm just saying. Yeah. It's, Everybody uh, needs to side hustle. Somebody make it. It's a great opportunity for the World Cup in uh, Qatar. Yeah, do a chatbot for the World Cup in Qatar. Where's the stadium? How do I get access? Why do I hook up the online gift shop? How do I get back to my hotel? 
Uh, I want tickets. I want extra tickets. I want premium tickets. I want VIP access. Like you can, we did one of those for the Olympics once, which was kind of cool. Yeah, that's really cool. Um, this is about, uh, but it, it was focused on the athletes. So it's like, how do I get to the? How do I get to my hotel? Or like to the village, and then from the village, what time do I need to get ready to go to the stadium, etc.? It's kind of fun. It sounds like a great conversational challenge. Now you just kept it super simple because <laughs> <laughs> it was too complex. <laughs> Oh, a chatbot football commentator. Now that is cool. I actually worked at a, a startup, or I guess I was helping out with what they were doing. Uh, they had like high frequency trading software. So they had super mm -hmm. quick engines. And what we were trying to do was actually take the feed of football games. And then as that feed came in, something happened to the game. You immediately can do like a live bet. So then you'd get like a thing. If somebody gets the ball, oh, is he going to score a goal, etc. It was really cool, but you could get it in a chatbot too, I guess. But then you'd have more latency. Yeah. That's right. Football I... player quiz. Everybody go play the football player quiz on Facebook Messenger. <laughs> I think you're actually pretty good in that. Uh... Talking uh, me through this. <laughs> <laughs> you just keep um, breathing, Barrett. You just keep breathing. I'll just keep talking. Uh, I, I will uh, figure this out. I have tremendous this, faith in our ability to fill time. This was not a trick to uh, lure you guys into the Facebook group, but I just uh, approved 14 uh, guy, 14 people. So people are dripping in. Well, well played, Barrett. Well played. <laughs> <laughs> I thought Facebook was dead, but. And now you're all part of his pyramid scheme. <laughs> uh, let me check. Yeah, we just have to start at one point and then uh, people can drop in. Cool, cool. Is there people playing the football player quiz yet on Facebook Messenger? Some of the first chatbots I ever made were also on Facebook, but they were really bad. And then you had a. Uh, you had these credit card companies and they would do the ads and, and drive you to the chat bot and then try and get your details and then that was sold the back yeah i guess that's that's why these messenger chatbots never became successful yeah it's like the wild west so what's the score and uh where's the game up to so the Netherlands played yesterday, and we did well, I believe. I was yeah, told like, uh, that we were awesome. 6-1 against uh, Turkey. Uh, OK, I'm multitasking here. Uh, we have 15 people watching, so that's great. I will <laughs> keep on approving. Uh... So Hans. <laughs> Thanks. Uh, good evening, uh, good morning, and good afternoon, botpreneurs. Uh, it's good to be back on air. Uh, the idea was to go live for the first time on LinkedIn as well, but that, there was a big uh, technical uh, hiccup there. But nevertheless, we're going to make a great show for you guys because yeah, we have uh, we have Hans van Dam with us from the Conversation Design Institute. Also in Amsterdam, so uh, yeah, I think we uh, are, I don't know, 10 kilometers apart or 15 maybe. I'm in Amsterdam, uh, south, south, so I'm still saying. Uh, <laughs> um, I'm, I'm near Amsterdam, yeah. yeah. <laughs> so before I, uh, I hand the mic to you, I have some household uh, messages. Um, first of all, I think we can split the group in uh, maybe into to two types of people, the ones that are just making the transition to conversational AI and the, uh, yeah, the botpreneurs who are busy with it for uh, quite some time already and want to uh, yeah, upgrade their, uh, their play. Um, so if you can yeah, leave in the comments on Facebook uh, 
if you are a newbie or not, then uh, we would be very thankful. It's also nice if you tell us where you're watching from, which country. And what right. do you want from this session? Let us yeah. know. Exactly. Let us know. We want to answer as many questions live as possible. Uh, I also prepared a list uh, as a backup in case you guys uh, go numb. Um, and last but not least, Hans has a sort of giveaway at the end of the show. It's not about the online courses because I already gave the discount code for that. Uh, so stay with us. Uh, okay. Oh, I see what you did there, Hans. I see what you did there. Um, <laughs> approve some more membership requests. Um, yeah, Hans, back to you. And let's start at the beginning. How did your journey in conversational AI uh, start well, off? The journey. The journey in conversational AI, I like the, the word AI there because it took us a while to figure out like uh, that it was, that I was even in AI. But uh, <laughs> I, I, I was like when I was studying, I was doing like European history and European literature and I wanted to be a, a writer. And, uh, and then I wrote the manuscripts and the publishers were like, oh, that's not very good. So maybe you go do something else. So then I became a copywriter and I worked at a startup incubator here. And so I learned a bit about technology and, and I learned about entrepreneurship, which was fun. And I was part of like a video streaming uh, startup, which failed miserably. Um, and so I got a job in customer service and I was mm -hmm. working for KLM here in Amsterdam. We were on social media uh, helping like stranded travelers find their luggage around the world. And so I was in customer service, and then people started automating customer service, and I joined a company called CX Company that's now part of CM. Um, learn more about chatbots, and then when like it became more conversational because there used to be mm -hmm. these virtual assistants, right? You'd ask a question, and they wouldn't know the answer, um, and it became more of a conversation. Then I figured, oh wait, I, I like to write, and I know how to write dialogue. Uh, I understand some of the technology because I worked at the incubator. I understand the customer service space, so I could probably like figure this out. <clears throat> so I started working on that and trying to solve that problem a little bit. And I figured like all these tech companies, they just want to sell technology in these enterprises. They don't really know what to do. So I figured if, if we focus on actually solving the problem of the design, then we're in good shape. And uh, the way I sort of saw is that everybody's selling hammers and we were the carpenters. But I didn't really think that, like, I didn't know it was AI. And then I was, like, invited to, uh, to a conference in London, Cargax, which is a great festival. It's a festival, actually. Uh, highly recommend anyone going there. Uh, but all of a sudden, I was part of an AI panel. And I, was, like, all, and I was just, like, a writer writing dialogues and writing stuff for, uh, for chatbots. The word AI had not really crossed my mind yet. But then all of a sudden, like, we, we heard... It's particularly the people that knew a lot about AI that saw the value that we were delivering. So that's like, oh, wait, that's interesting. So apparently we're bringing something to the AI space that is needed. And that's kind of how we then started. Yeah, so we already we had a company called Robocopy, which is very much an agency. Then we started training people uh, in conversation design. And then eventually that was got a lot of traction. We rebranded re to Conversation Design Institute. Um, and now we have both like a training side of the business and a consulting side. Cool. Yeah, I uh, I did the first training. I think you guys put online via Robocopy. Oh, really? That's a long time ago. Cool. Uh, yeah, I like the uh, the robot uh, voice uh, at the end of each uh, each chapter. But <laughs> Ah, Conversation <laughs> Academy. Yeah, that was... yeah, I'm a sci-fi nerd, but uh, that's not uh, what we're here for tonight. We have a lot of comments coming in. So uh, we have newbies and uh, people from Amsterdam, Canada. So that's great. India. Oh, that's in the middle of the night. Uh, thanks so much for oh, uh, staying up. Yeah. Uh, Englishman in Belgrado. OK, cool, guys. Very cool. Um, yeah, do you think we can make another uh, division? Uh, so 
you have to work uh, to make sure the bot says the right thing and you have to work to make sure the bot understands what the user means uh, mm -hmm. yeah do you agree on that split and how do you uh, yeah yeah manage that in the trainings yeah so f so for us in general like our whole philosophy was that if you have an artificial brain talk to human brain then you want to understand technology you want to understand psychology and they need to be equally important so we have three certificates um so there's the ai trainer that person turns data into understanding this is the person that trains the language models this person is in charge of understanding what people say um, and implements it in the technology and then you have the conversation designers that make sure that people feel understood right uh that, that make sure that we have a human-centric approach approach to communication to designing these assistants but what we noticed so we had those two rules and now we added like the third which is the conversational copywriter which is a bit more it's a stronger writing it's more about personality it's more about behavior design uh it's often like the most senior copywriter on the team because some of the people that are doing the conversation design that think more about the structure of the conversation and the order of information how you're presenting that they sometimes miss like the final touch of of the copywriting so yeah. We we have that as a separate certificate now. It's sometimes it's often you know one person with two certificates, but it's definitely a a different skill set that is required. And that what we see with most teams, like the ratio is like three AI trainers, two conversation designers, and one copywriter. So if you then sort of then it's you know three people focusing on the human, three people focusing on the AI. So it's like equally, it's not it's neatly balanced yeah yeah so, and i think companies are all in their own uh yeah, at their own point in the journey some are years ahead of others uh, and you see companies compare new teams and people who uh, can spend 50 percent of their time on, on conversational and then they just scale it up um and yeah and, do you do you also see that and do you think the pandemic gave a boost to the whole uh, ecosystem we we are in well you're saying a lot there man that's uh okay <laughs> that's uh let, let me unravel break that it a down. Bit. yeah break it down so i think there's companies that are years ahead uh but most companies just started a couple of years early uh and a lot of them actually have created a lot of stuff that they need to throw out and start from scratch again so the first movers aren't always the uh the best movers um but yeah we we kind of see a, a little bit of everything and we were always like how do you like do you need to always do the right design and all of it immediately and how do you approach that and the new narrative that we've developed now is that the more conversations you have the better they should be so if you look at you know, if you're just developing a, a POC, then actually a few people, you know, as a part-time thing, because they'll have other responsibilities, can actually hack together a functional chatbot, right? And just, you know, prove a point or prove a concept and then, you know, maybe get more budget and get more traction and more stakeholder support. So as you, where you are in that journey, as you go from like a functional assistant to an ultimately delightful assistant as you do that you need more resources you need more people so yeah you go from two people hacking something together on a friday afternoon to teams that we have that are like 100 people strong working on the ai assistants uh, yeah. okay. and i think around like the COVID stuff what you saw is that like as soon as it hit like everything was like step on the brakes we're not doing anything and then people adjust a little bit and then i think yeah i think it has definitely accelerated conversational ai but like this it's just, it, it accelerated a trend that was already happening right so it's not like all of a sudden they need they wanted this and they needed this it's like okay now it's a no-brainer to invest in it immediately um so yeah it's been, it's been good COVID's been been good in that regard. Yeah, yeah. Um, we also have a viewer from New York. I, I don't see your names here. Wouter is there. Long time I see. I know Wouter. Um, <laughs> what? Uh, 
and long question what what will i find in your courses that i can't find in top books on conversational design and bots uh yeah how would you what? benchmark that uh, uh yeah. Yeah. yeah so, so, so how, how, so how does our <laughs> yes how does our stuff stack up to other people there's like a ton of courses out there some of them are actually pretty okay um I think the main difference is that we're not just creating a course. What we actually have is a certification program that is recognized by companies around the world. So we have a foundation. That foundation has written a manifesto together with all its stakeholders. That mm -hmm. manifesto calls for alignment and standardization in conversation design. Um, and what that supports is a human-centric workflow uh that we teach and certify people on so we don't just teach people like how do you create a chatbot no we teach you like a step-by-step -step workflow that allows you to work at an enterprise uh and these certificates are backed by open voice network which is part of linux foundation salesforce is supporting this rasa is supporting this chat layer cognitive uh so we actually have relationships with all these technology companies that recognize <coughs> and endorse our certification program so we envision that other people will actually develop courses and um, those courses will prepare them for the exam that they take at cdi uh, ultimately we're really the standard for the enterprise of how how you want to build a team so compare it kind of to like scrum or agile type things right this is a workflow and once you master this workflow, you can onboard teams faster. Companies are looking for people with this certificate. So it's really helping the market as a whole to increase that liquidity where it gives people a clear career perspective. It makes it easier to hire people. Technology companies know who's going to be using the products, but it's also university. So we, we have a lot of universities that take our courses to prepare their students for jobs in conversational AI. So I think that's like the difference of the problem we're trying to solve if you compare us to other courses. They're creating a course to teach you a skill, which is great. We're creating an industry standards that provides career opportunities and allows companies to scale their operation. So it's a win-win-win situation, right? Yeah, we're doing win-win-win-win-win situation, yeah. <laughs> Cool, cool. Uh, I like this other question that I do see pop in uh, at the top, but I saw we skip one, but I like this one too. Do we have vertical specific courses? It's a short one, so it resonates with me quickly. Um, sure. we're, we're working on a lot of that stuff. So we will be offering more technology courses. We'll be offering, so how do I now build something with Raza? How do I build something with Watson or whatever? Then there's gonna be interface specific courses. So we're currently working with Haptic to create a WhatsApp course. So now how do I create something for WhatsApp? And then the next step is also more vertical specific ones. And then uh, one of the things that we look at now is, is you know, kind of the highly regulated industries. So if I'm at an enterprise in at a pharmaceutical or the healthcare company, how do I make sure, you know, there's a lot of legal information that's part of the experience. How do I manage the stakeholders? How do I navigate that world? Uh, so those types of certificates will be developed as well. Cool, cool. Um, yeah, uh, I was I like also this thinking. Hmm? No, it's going to say, yeah, it's another good question. How do we explain the value of conversation design? <clears throat> Which I think is a very it, it's a very good question. Um, like a lot. Of, so what we encounter most companies when they reach out, they're sort of over invested in conversational AI technology. They're just not getting the value, and then they just hear about conversation design, and and that's usually when they reach out. But if you understand, if you just ask about the problems they have, then oftentimes the, <clears throat> the solution is in design, right? And what you'll encounter a lot of times is that if they have a team of engineers, then everything is an engineering problem. But as soon as you put a few designers in the room, then all of a sudden you start to discover some design problems. So if you have, I always use this very simple <clears throat> uh, uh, example that if, if the assistant says, ask me any question, you know, 
your customer can ask you any question, it's going to be very difficult to recognize what they're saying and get matched into the right intent and provide them with a good answer. But actually by saying, you know, you can ask me questions about coffee, uh, you're already framing it in such a way that you influence customers and they're probably going to ask you questions about coffee, right? So yeah. by being more proactive and, and more design savvy, you take more control of the conversation and you will greatly see cognition improve. Um, you'll be driving more towards behavior. So a lot of times the companies where, where they fail is, you know, everything is an engineering problem. So they just build more and more and more, uh, which just costs more and creates more complexity. Uh, so once you start countering that, I guess that's what you're experiencing at work too. <laughs> Sometimes. Yeah, yeah. Cool. Yeah. Um, yeah. And I, I was also thinking what can, uh, especially newcomers do to, to get, uh, yeah, get a good foot in this, uh, in this field, but I think get going. yeah, for me, the most important thing was that I just started creating a bot, I made up a use case and. Uh, later on, I created the mother of all bots about chatbot platforms and connected dialogue flow and started to work with intents and stuff. And then you get users and you get to see uh, what's going on. Mm -hmm. And then you, you understand that your users will probably not follow the happy path you had in mind. And a lot of <laughs> things can happen. A lot of things yeah. can, can derail. Uh, and it's great to see yeah, new requirements coming in via the data, of course. So you can. Uh, yeah, decide which go, which yeah. way to go. What what uh, parts do you want to uh, add to your bot? Yeah, or, or yeah the, I into. mean the, the the key there is to sort of treat users as people. That's <laughs> I think like see them as as actual human beings that are trying to accomplish something, and then understand what that means to them, how important that is to them and how they might think about that and how they might feel about that and how they then might interact. And that's how you sort of anticipate uh, what might happen in a conversation. And, and that's, so we do a lot of role playing there as well to sort of just say it out loud, have the, conver have the conversation uh, to figure out what makes the most sense. And then you, based on that, you sort of start driving it uh, towards desired behavior and take more control of the interaction. Yeah. Um, one of the things when you say like building, we're we're actually launching like a full platform in a couple of months that allows people to follow the courses, but also take assessments, take the exams. Uh, there's going to be discussion forums for people to have more of these conversations, be more active in the community. Uh, as you know, if you build your own like little side project, like you did with the mother of all bots, like. You can talk about it with other people. There's going to be a job board there for people to uh, get going in the industry. Because uh, we've not done a very good job at that initially. Like launching people towards those first step is very theory focused. So yeah, and I was also thinking a great use case is of course to make a resume bot for yourself to to yeah, to land that first uh, job or or uh, freelance yeah. project. And uh, yeah. Just try it out on your uh, friends, uh, families, and fools first, and then, uh, yeah. If you're not comfortable with sharing the bot right away on LinkedIn, you can also uh, share a screencast video, which shows the perfect oh, yeah. uh, happy path, of course. But I think, yeah, uh, get going, get get your hands in the dirt is really, really important. Uh, besides, uh, yeah, good training and, uh, and online courses, of course. Um, let's see some. Some someone is already looking forward to the Rasa course, so that's great. Oh, so we only yeah. have some Rasa stuff. If you go to the website, you'll find some Rasa stuff there. Yeah, and then we're what, doing uh, WhatsApp coming more. soon. Yeah, Cogni. we have Voice Flow, uh Voice Flow is coming. WhatsApp's coming. Bot Press is coming. Um, so I think where we ultimately will be is like we'll have the CDI courses that are just our courses centered around that workflow and applied at different verticals and different technologies. And then we're going to be become kind of like a, a niche Udemy entirely focused on the conversational AI community. So some of the stuff will be more 
you know, around voice, around sonic branding. I just would be more about, you know, training models, uh, QBox. We have a QBox course. So that's kind of how we're going to grow the library and, and just bring in more and more stuff. Some of it will be created by us. Some will be created us with another company. Um, so we're doing one with the Alan Turing Institute, for example. That's also one that we co-create. And some of the courses we kind of curate. If somebody has something that we like, uh, that we feel makes sense for our audience, then we just add it to the to the library. Cool. I'm just playing around with my uh, new uh, broadcasting studio, but I can just uh, yeah. Let's see. And I see one. Uh, so great. Point, I like. Uh, oh yeah, advice? I saw the one. Uh, yeah, go off. Sorry. What's your advice on fine tuning the responses to be direct? To the point effective but not very aggressive and not too jetty uh, yeah that's a, yeah that's a good question of course not easy to answer yeah so yeah. there's uh sometimes it's like do you want to it, it kind of has to do with the uh, type of journey right so if, if you have a highly motivated person that just wants an answer to get the information that they need you can be more straight you know talk to the point if it is more complex the conversations are going to get longer and you know there's going to be more turns because if you're let's say you're a bank everybody that has to talk to a bank immediately feels dumb and insecure about everything in life so then when you answer as the bank you need to consider those feelings and you're going to have a longer conversation it doesn't mean that you need long messages but it just takes a few more turns um, so there's no like direct answer of, of what to do when but like we said earlier, like mentalize the context of the conversation and, and see what it understand what it means to people. And then you kind of, you know, you'll understand how to write for it. Um, if you have like these very long messages, what we do then is uh, there's kind of a pattern, one breath test. If you can't say it in one breath, it's too long. Then you do the Jenga technique. So on average, when you write something, you can take out 50% of the words without the tower of meaning collapsing, uh, they are, end up with a bunch of stuff. So what you do then per prompt is acknowledgement, confirmation, prompt. Uh, so acknowledgement, I hear you, confirmation, I understand what you said, prompt is now it's your turn to speak again. Um, and since you're chopping it up in multiple messages, you're going to be using discourse markers. Um, so then you end up with messages like, oh, there's, in order to do this, there's three things to consider. First of mm -hmm. all, blah 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 second of all and that's how you sort of chop it up um so that's how you can deal with those yeah so the short answer is of course it depends <laughs> it depends i totally could have said that yeah <laughs> you were so I smart but like, yeah. <laughs> I, I could have just said that yeah yeah so uh, I've saved a lot of time <laughs> <laughs> the brevity that's kind of the answer to the question as well i also see the the one earlier oh you put a different one but we're skipping the one on the privacy data security protocols for chatbot architecture can i tell a bit more about this plan and the idea behind it i like to do that one because it's my passion project for a long time cool. uh, yeah so the the thinking here is that there's two trends in the world companies want more and more data and people wondering like, hey, what are you doing with that data? And those two trends cannot coexist. So we need to figure out how we develop more trust and more security around conversational data. Because um, there's two, two, those two trends, but ultimately if we're, you know, what we want to do with conversational AI is have more personalized, more transactional, uh, consultive interactions. That means I'm going to even require more data from my, from my customers, right? So what we need to do is actually create an environment in which people can have proper and meaningful conversations without any concern about data. So what this does is uh, it's, it's a new security protocol and what we're launching is what we call trust box. So when a bank talks to a customer, they actually talk in a little trust box that's being created where they can have a conversation where they can exchange information. And then at the end of the conversation, the bank will say, hey, uh, Barent, I'm going to store this in the back end. The rest of the conversation I'm going to throw out. And you can verify that your information is being deleted. Um, so that's the initial thing. Uh, we are, we're actually like the, 
open source. Part of it's going to be released pretty soon. Um, but yeah, we're creating a, a, a safe environment for people to have meaningful conversations through AI systems. Um, and then the second step of that would be to create more or better identity systems around conversational AI to recognize people so that we can actually have these conversations. So, so it would yeah, preferably become a standard, of course, that can be used by... Uh, <laughs> we always aim for the standards of our yeah. organization. <laughs> well, it sounds pretty uh, cool and uh, ambitious yeah. uh, as well. Yeah, and what's one of the cool things that I like about it, because the context of the conversation actually sits within the trust box, this allows it, so, because let's say, uh, so one of the issues identified by Open Voice Network and is that, how do you transfer context between assistants, right? So let's say I talk to an airliner, but then that airline is gonna check a hotel for me and that hotel is gonna check a restaurant for me. So you're gonna have different AI systems interact with different AI systems. How do you then make sure that your information and your context does not spread around the internet, right? But yeah. if we have this trust box and it actually happens here, then these different AI systems can tap into that environment and all that information never actually has to go to the organization that needs to make use of it. Yeah, sounds like a plan. Yeah, cool. cool. Okay, then I'll just display the, the other question about natural language generation and knowledge graphs. Yeah, uh, we're all out of business soon. <laughs> no. Robots uh, take over, yeah. Are taken over. Now, I mean, there, there's a lot of interesting and good stuff being developed, obviously, and it is really exciting. And, and uh, I think we as conversation designers should be looking forward to working with these systems and being able to fine tune them. And so a lot of the work, maybe some of the basics, could be handled by these newer technologies, but actually the stuff that you need to fine tune and that you need to design. And then we talk about tone of voice and personality and behavior design to get specific things done to drive people to a certain outcome. Those are the things that become extra exciting. And, and that's why you're gonna make a difference, right? Because brands just wanna have their unique voice and they wanna have the unique approach to conversations. So it's gonna be incredibly exciting to actually work with this. and. Yeah, if, if you now, you know, a lot, a lot of time of conversation designers is wasted mm -hmm. in content management and tapping into the different business lines of getting the information and structuring that information. Well, if you can now, if that becomes easier with knowledge graphs and some of the NLG models are out there, then you can actually start working on the, on the really cool stuff and, and creating so, those journeys. So it's so then it's the... <laughs> then your the chatbot can have like multiple tones of voice uh, depending on which kind of user if it's a youngster or a, uh, yeah mid, mid age guys like us <laughs> <laughs> hey no, but you can make uh, variable answers also right with with energy. yeah well yeah then you'd get into the personalized thing so what you would need for that is an identity system that lives with the customer right so that's also where kodaka the protocol would come in but uh no it's it's very exciting it's really cool but it doesn't mean that we're out of work it's just that we get fancier tools to work with that make our lives easier i think that's the way to look at it and sure we don't we don't know what it looks like 10 years from now but i do know that most public companies do not want an ai to speak on their behalf they want people involved to make yeah. sure that that ai is doing a proper that it's speaking inclusive that the models are trained in an inclusive way that we you know don't just understand yeah, white men but that we understand other people too so there's a lot of work yeah and uh, yeah like microsoft uh, put their bot on twitter and let people train it was also not a good idea as we all know <laughs> some supervised uh, learning is <laughs> recommendable um Okay, very good. Thanks for sharing your insights. Uh, let's see. Yeah, I, I recently did the AI, AI trainer course with you guys, mm. which is uh, which is really cool. And it, uh, yeah, also touches topics like data labeling, which yeah, stuff that's for some people more uh, more boring, but for others uh, more interesting. So it's uh, yeah, I think it's a huge challenge to uh, 
let's say if you start with your bot and you have 50 intents, uh, what will be your next 10 intents to build and, and the next 10? And, and how do you scale that up? And uh, yeah, how do you tackle the conflicts between intents that you will uh, for sure uh, get on your path? Uh, maybe it's also nice to, to, to tell a bit more about that part of uh, conversational AI. Yeah, so I mean, AI training, we, what we notice with a lot of our companies is that uh, for engineers, they don't really care for it. For data scientists, it's kind of boring. Um, and designers often kind of get intimidated when they have to work in dialogue flow or, or Watson or whatever. Mm -hmm. So we, we saw AI training as a specific role that's like the bridge between the designers and the developers. And it's important for companies to actually recognize it as a role and give people the freedom to to study it and get good at it because most companies fail here. All right, so they just put in like 10 different ways of ordering coffee, but it's it's terrible. Like it's not good training phrases. It's completely out of balance. So some intents will have 50 training phrases and others just have five. That confuses yeah. the whole database. So you wanna, it, it's, you know, it's a serious job to figure out how to, to build these things. Um, so one hand you wanna, you know, you want to gather uh, utterances, and then these utterances you want to clean up and turn into training phrases. Then you want to make sure that all these training phrases are inclusive and that you're actually understanding everybody. Because um, the way we speak is very much a part of our identity. So if I say something to an assistant and it's it completely ignores me because I use some sort of accent because of my background or whatever. Maybe I'm an immigrant and I don't speak you know, as fluent as other people and I'm completely ignored by the system. You're actually rejecting me as a human and it's a pretty big deal. So as an AI trainer, you have that responsibility to create an inclusive assistant that understands everybody. And then once you start doing that and your corpus grows, you get more and more intense so now you get these competing intents so then you know you got a lot of ambiguity that you need to solve for so how do you do that and you, you know create intent hierarchies and you create these umbrella dialogues so it's it's a it's a great role we see a lot of people very much enjoy it once they discover it because they're you know they're semi engineers but they're hanging out with the business people a lot they're hanging out with the designers they're advising the designers a lot of times because designers often don't know how to make use of, of entities and stuff well enough. So all of a sudden, you know, AI trainers can come in and give designers superpowers. Um, so yeah, it's, it's a fun role. And yeah, the bigger the operation gets, the more important it gets as well. Yeah. And, sure. um, the AI trainer is also the person, you know, it's going to go over the data, over the analytics and find ways to optimize it. Sometimes that's just around cognition and changing some of these training phrases. Sometimes it's actually going back to the designers and like, hey, you, you want to rethink this whole journey, uh, etc. Yeah. 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 I'm, I'm currently in a AI trainer role and it, I like it very much. But yeah. There's so many different roles. It's important for people to find their uh, yeah, their sweet spot. But uh, yeah, just, just... Uh, it, 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 we're hiring AI trainers. So I see people in the chat. Darren, you too. If you want to make the jump, come on board. There's, I know that we have a lot of need for AI trainers. So okay, uh, cool, cool. I'll uh, keep it in shoot, mind. Uh, 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 yeah, shoot yeah, me a people, message. Uh, <laughs> people watching, shoot uh, shoot Hans a message. Um, Let's see, yeah. Which yeah, segments do you guys uh, distinguish? Uh, I know the corporate enterprise world is is uh, I presume your bread and butter, but of course you also have small business owners, uh, web shops, yeah. uh, so, software as a service. Uh, these are all, of course, very interesting. Uh, yeah. Yeah, I mean, I mean for us right now. Uh, yeah, most of it is enterprise customer service heavy operations that are, well, I got a fly on my monitor. Um, customer service heavy operations that have the highest need, but we also see more and more uh, product companies that want to have conversational AI assistance in their own products. So they're reaching out now as well. Uh, 
and have these assistants and different, you know, on board. So there's like insurance company that's like super conversational and, and they even have, they have the app and it's like a conversational onboarding and stuff like that. So they have very, they have a few very mission critical journeys that are just key to the entire operation. So we, we have some of those as well. Um, yeah, and I think WhatsApp is just going to be, that's where everybody's going to be active. And it's like a whole new sector and domain. Um, but I, I guess it's not really answering your question. Like, so, but I guess that, yeah, what we recognize, I mean, most of it is still enterprises, but you see more and more initiatives. But you also see like in uh, interactive storytelling in voice particularly, right? That's that's also an interesting market. Yeah, museums, to think for of. example. Yeah, museums, but also, uh, so what they're doing in China now is, uh, so they take, nobody reads books. Um, so they take these books, they, they create a voice, then you, all of a sudden you have an audio book that just reads out the whole book. But now they're looking at, okay, the next step is how do you make that entire book interactive and, and how do you solve that problem? So there's, there's, you know, interactive journalism, there's interactive storytelling, uh, interactive news. So there's quite a few cool things. And then there's like robots, there's virtual beings, but you could say those are glorified chatbots, right? If, if you sort of have a character on your website, uh, this kind of is still a chatbot. <clears throat> but once you go into robots, some virtual beings or some elements in the metaverse, you're also now dealing with gestures and emotion. So as an AI trainer, those are, are cool things to solve for as well. So you see those industries emerge as well. And for us, that's also what we're going to be focused on. It's like we, we see the world as uh, everybody's going to have an AI assistant, and that AI assistant interfaces with people via different channels. So that might be a chatbot, or that might be a voice assistant, or that might be a robot. That can be anything. But as a company, mm -hmm. you want to build one AI assistant that interfaces with people in all these different channels. So we're robots and, and virtual beings are very much uh, on our roadmap as well. Cool. Yeah, I checked uh, Facebook because then I can see the names of the people who are asking the questions. So Oliver, Oliver Day asked, where are the AI trainer vacancies hidden? So uh, you have your first uh, person. Oh, God, I think, all, I think Oliver actually graduated this week. <laughs> uh, or no, funny. wait, I saw his name pop up. Where did I see it? Did you graduate? Wait, what was the story? Uh, yeah, just reach out, man. Uh, please, please do. We are uh, we're we're growing really fast on the on the consulting sites in, in uh, both the EU and in North America. So people that are interested in that, uh, just shoot yeah. us a message. Yeah, and of course, your consultancy site offers a great way to uh, incorporate real experience into your training material and. I think that's a nice uh, closed loop you've got uh, going on there, of course. Because yeah, you have clients uh, not only in Netherlands, not only in Europe, right? Uh, no, no. So we, I mean, um, when organizations get to a certain scale, that's when they reach out to us. So once you start thinking about how do I build like a twenty-person team. Uh, that's when we're the only shop in town. So our clients are around the world, really. Uh, and we have people everywhere working with them. Um, yeah, so so we're more, yeah, our, our clients are more split into like how big are these operations rather than where are they geographically located. Yeah. And Oliver, by the way, uh, replied that he graduated uh, Monday. Yeah. <laughs> Everybody give it up for Oliver. Yay, <laughs> Oliver. Nice work. Welcome to the club of uh, computational AI. Um, let's see. Another question from. Uh, oh, I need I need new glasses. Okay. Another question from Hal's Turner. Uh, how do you test the conversational AI, and how do you measure how successful it is? Now that's a great question. Yeah. Okay. So with the testing, there's like two sides of it, right? There's functional testing, like does it work? Uh, but during the design process, you also want to do a Wizard of Oz testing. Like, does it make does the design make any sense? And there's very complicated, expensive ways of doing that. But what we like to do is actually when you design something, you you kind of have a script, right? You have a flowchart and a script, or in a tool, mm -hmm. 
And then you test it out with like five to 10 people and they can speak freely and you just answer what you've written down in your script. And, um, you know, very quickly you'll discover what needs to change and what needs to get better. So when you design a conversation, this is the way to very quickly get feedback um, before you waste any expensive engineering or AI training hours. So always do that. Obviously not for a simple Q&A uh, thing, but if you're doing like more important journeys. So that's how you want to test. And then you have like your functional tests, obviously. And then uh, what was the second part? It was like, how do I see if it's working, right? It, it was uh, the performance yeah. stuff. How do you yeah. measure how successful this, uh, which KPIs yeah. to, uh, to watch? Yeah. So it kind of depends on the operation. But if like earlier stage operations, when things are very much focused on the functional side and cost reduction, we're often looking uh, you know, key key uh, the key, key KPI is going to say. But I guess uh, the main KPIs are are containment. That's what a lot of companies are looking for. So you can just measure like how many people that we actually keep in this conversation and how many did we lose. So a lot of times they focus on containment, uh, but Ultimately, you want to get to more qualitative metrics. So you want to be looking at CSAT scores and NPS, right? Would they tell their friends about this? Um, but initially, because your team is small, you're going to be looking at quantitative metrics like containment. Um, and once you have those first wins in, you sort of add more copyright, you add more persona, you add more behavior design, so you start focusing on the qualitative metrics. Those are very important. And then there is the cognitive metrics that are more about, you know, how well did we understand the question? Uh, you know, did we match to the right intent? Um, that's, that's one that you always want to look for. And our AI trainers, they continuously do these K-fold tests to just look at, you know, how is the database organized? Where, where do we have blind spots? What do we need to do? What do we need to change? Um, so yeah, in the experience, you go <clears throat> initially from quantitative to qualitative metrics, from containment to NPS, for example. And then if you look at cognition, uh, you know, you're, you're doing K-fold stuff, so you're just looking at the data to see how well you match the uh, stuff. Yeah, and I think a pitfall can be to ask too frequently, did I help you with this answer? Did I help you? Did you like yeah. my answer? Because that ruins, of course, it gives you data, but it also kind of ruins the conversational experience. So that's, I think, yeah, a fine line uh, to uh, to walk. But uh, do you agree on that? What's your take? Yeah. I mean, for us, like it's it's they're so panicky about the containment and just like they're, they're so panicky that they ask those questions. They do a very short answer and then they ask the question just to get some wins. Uh, so we like to just have longer conversations at the end. It's like, hey man, did I do a good job helping you? It's like, yeah. Would you recommend other people talking to me? It's like, yeah. All right, cool. That's your That's cool. NPS score. So um, that you ask for people to rate the whole journey and not just one query yeah. and another query. Yeah. Yeah. So we actually have a client right now that are so folk that the management is demanding certain KPIs that it actually uh, stops the team from working well because they're focused on the wrong metrics. So they have no room to actually try and make it better because they need, so they're kind of manipulating containment and those sort of metrics. So it's pretty tricky. So it's important for management and the team to align on what the KPI should be, because otherwise you sort of get these weird incentives and yeah, you're yeah. steering the ship in the wrong direction. And what you said, the KPIs might for sure change during uh, yeah, during time. Cool, something funny is going on because uh, Wouters, Wouters Lichter is, uh, is also recruiting Oliver now. <laughs> so you have to <laughs> I guess it's very, I guess it's very simple. Do you want to work with the CDI graduate or do you want to work with CDI? You know, I guess that's. <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, he, he's suddenly in a luxury uh, position, which is great. Great. Yeah, I think as a uh, as a ecosystem, we are still like a baby or a toddler if you compare it to a human life. Uh, we haven't yeah we haven't even started yet. I think. You cannot imagine uh, what it will look like in a couple of decades. And, uh, yeah, it's going to move pretty fast. Yeah, it's, it's going to be it's a, it's a very exciting industry to be part of. And I think also for anyone that's like looking at what do I want to do in my career, I think like 
stepping into the world of conversational AI and becoming a designer and AI trainer is, is really the quickest way to level up your career because you're going to be in a high demand job. Yeah. Uh, people used to want to be like a doctor or a lawyer, but now you can be you can go from customer service agent to high potential AI trainer at an enterprise overnight almost. It's a, it's a good career move. Yeah, and, and I find it fascinating because it's, yeah, I like language. So it's about language, it's also psychology, and it's also about data. So it's, uh, yeah, a, a great combination, I think. Um, yeah, it's already uh, one hour in our show. Uh, maybe it's also time to uh, let viewers know what special perk or present you had in mind for them. Are we talking about the festival? I, I was like, why do I have a, a thing here? But it's because it's really no, I'm talking about the festival. Uh, talking about the festival, yeah. We did another. I don't know who joined us for the last one, but it was pretty good. We did the Conversation Design Festival. It's the first edition. We had uh, 355 people online for more than eight hours. So people, I guess, they either left the TV on or. They actually enjoyed it, but they were online for eight plus hours. And it was really cool, and we were very happy and proud. Um, so we decided to do another one, which is going to be on the 30th of November. Uh, we're going to probably be looking at a two-day event, uh, so one day more practical and, and workshops, and the next day is going to be keynotes, panels, tech companies, uh, a lot of cool stuff there. So, yeah, November 30th, and I think you have coupon. Well, yeah, I think they're <laughs> coupon. There's yeah, I'm uh, copy pasting it uh, right now in the Facebook comments, and we'll also share it on LinkedIn, of course. Uh, so, yeah, there are discount codes which people can use on top of the early bird tickets as long as they are available, of course. Uh, so you better be quick. But uh, yeah, it sounds like great deal, great uh, how do you call it, great bargain, value for money. Uh, yeah, it's gonna it's gonna be a lot of fun. And people actually said, and I did not even force them to. They said it was the best conference they'd been to during all of COVID. So uh, that was kind of cool. Yeah. That's so, uh, and and we learned a lot. It was a lot of fun. And uh, we might do like a job fair, make that kind of part of it. We'll have some hackathons. Um, yeah, please join. It's quite a challenge to uh, have a really yeah, vivid event uh, online uh, to somehow make their live events uh, yeah. to a certain degree of course because nothing can match uh, the real yeah we streamed, uh, we streamed for 14 I hours i was beat last, was, oh yeah last time we started there was berlin is that what you're gonna say yeah berlin uh december 2019 uh COVID was just around the corner <laughs> yeah that was my last uh, uh, e er in real life event. Uh, so, are we doing a conversation design hackathon? Yes, uh, but I always do that ten x. Like, think of what you have in mind now when you say conversation design hackathon, and then multiply that by x. That's what we're uh, by ten x. That's what we're thinking about when we say doing a hackathon. Yeah. Okay, great. I like uh, <laughs> the le level of uh, goal <laughs> to achieve. That's great. That's great. Um, yeah. So let's. I think we can wrap it up here. Uh, it was a great talk. Uh, some uh, some trouble at the beginning, but that's uh, that's all my life. Um, it was worth the wait. Yeah. Well, thanks a lot, and let's have to talk again in uh, I don't know six months or so, and uh, see where we're at. Yeah. Um, that's fine. Let's do that. So I will also share the discount codes again. For the, Training courses because they're it's twenty five percent off, so that's that's a uh, great uh, great deal as well. And we helped Oliver uh, with a job, that's for sure. Yeah. <laughs> Oliver is one. finally off the streets now. Yeah, God. <laughs> it was so about we, time, Oliver. <laughs> <laughs> it was uh, yeah, it was a great uh, great session. Uh, thanks a lot, guys. Uh, if you have other questions, just leave them in the comment uh, the video will be online forever and uh, we can answer, uh, answer later and i will upload the video to linkedin to uh, yeah make it up with the people that might be a little disappointed but uh, yeah that's uh, that's
that's yeah. what it is. Okay. Yeah. Great. All Thanks, right. Thank Hans, you. And great Thank you everybody. everybody watching and contributing with your questions. Uh, I have, yeah, I have three other interviews planned, by the way. So next month, uh, Care Knowledgeware, uh, and it's called uh, uh, Integrate Enterprise Content in Your Chatbot Automatically. So that's good. And in November, I actually have Rasa on the show. Uh, so about the open source conversational AI with Vincent uh, Wardang, and he knows, uh, I think, about every uh, little part of the Rasa system, so we can uh, ask him anything. And in December, an old friend, uh, Sasha Walter, who was uh, working for Cognigy and before that for uh, Amazon Alexa, he's now working for the German railways uh, on conversational stuff, and he will tell us how to design convincing conversational experiences. So, yeah, we've got some nice uh, things uh, lined up. Uh, thanks again, Hans, and uh, take care, and uh, see you later. Bye-bye. Thank you, everybody. Bye-bye.